Well, on vacation, I started reading the book, It's Not Your Turn, by Heather Thompson Day. Heather is a Twitter friend of mine, and we have discovered over the past year that we have a lot in common. Both raised in West Michigan, both moved to Colorado for a job, and eventually moved back to West Michigan to be closer to family. The obvious difference being that she is a best-selling author of six books, and, well, I'm me. But I was reading this book thinking it wasn't really for people like me. I love my job, I have a great wife, I have four great kids, I have a good life, I'm pretty content, I'm not sitting around stressed out or worrying that somehow I am not getting my fair share or fair shake in life. I feel pretty good about life. And then, on the day that I started writing this sermon, I got an email notice from LinkedIn about a classmate from my time at Indiana, and apparently he had recently sold his company, a music streaming company, for $200 million and been named CEO of the new company that had bought his company. Now, he's a really good guy. He's a really nice guy. He is a hardworking guy. He's a bright guy. But $200 million? I did not see that coming. And for just a moment, I thought, when is my turn coming? Not that there's any way I'm ever going to earn $200 million. And I thought to myself, I bet he never worries about how to send four kids to college or pay for all those braces. Now, that discontent was only there for a moment. But there is a reality that life does not turn out equal for all of us. God does not give everyone the same life, and God answers some of our prayers and not others in ways that we would like. And when that happens, we can grow frustrated with God, angry, even resentful that he isn't doing what we would like God to do. Maybe you have a friend who, after praying, breaks up with her not-so-great boyfriend, and then 20 minutes later, this great guy calls her up out of the blue, and they start dating and get married and have great kids, and he's a pastor, and her life seems perfect. That is literally my friend Heather Thompson Day's story from 15 years ago. But maybe you pray that prayer and break up with a not-so-great boyfriend, and then nothing not even a date since 2016. Or maybe you have a friend praying for a miraculous healing. They're all worked up over this sickness and they know the doctors can't do anything, but they keep praying and God answers their prayer and their parakeet gets better. Meanwhile, you may be praying for a loved one facing cancer and the news keeps coming and it keeps getting worse and you wonder, why would God answer a prayer about the bird but not your loved one. Or maybe there is someone you love who has wandered from God and they, it is tearing you up inside when you think about it. You are on your knees every day praying for that person, but their face is set against God and nothing seems to change. And then your friend who barely went to church and isn't much of a prayer has multiple kids who are all on fire for Jesus and active in their churches and you want to be excited for them. But in the back of your mind, you are angry with God. Why their kids and not the one you love? Now, I know that God does never sin, and so we never need to forgive God because there's nothing that God does we need to forgive. And yet, there is also our experienced reality that sometimes God does things that we do not understand. People die whom we love. The perfect job never materializes. The marriage doesn't get restored. Life is not always picture perfect. So what do we do when it feels like God has let us down? To answer that question, I want to tell you the story of a woman in the Old Testament who wrestled with God. But before we dive in, let's pray for God's blessing on the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord our God, 
In the reading and proclamation of your word, we pray you will illumine our minds and hearts so that we may hear and understand your word, know and live according to your word, and become living letters of your word, equipped to follow Jesus in every part of our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord, the living word. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes to us from 1 Samuel 1. Hear the word of our Lord for us today. There was a certain man from Ramathion, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jer Jeraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. So Elkanah has two wives, and their fortunes have been drastically different. Now remember, in the ancient world, especially in the Middle East, women gained value, they gained prestige, they gained honor by having male children. They gained economic security through those male children because their husbands were older than them and were very likely to die before them, and their only means of support would be their male sons. Without a male child, when their husband died, women would become homeless and often forced to begging on the street to survive. Penina has many sons and daughters, lots of little toddlers and teenagers running around. Hannah has none. Her value and worth by everyone around her is determined by her ability to have children, and as 1 Samuel 1.5 tells us, God has closed her womb. God has made her childless. God is denying her the one thing that would give her status and worth in her culture and security for the future. The one thing she needs, God has chosen to not give her. And then, on top of not getting the one thing she needs, Penina is not what one would call a nice sister wife. According to 1 Samuel 1, we read this. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Penina is the definition of a mean girl. She sees the weakness, she sees the anxiety, she sees the fear, and she just picks and picks and picks. She taunts and provokes until finally Hannah breaks down in tears. Not just once, but every year they play through the exact same script. Penina taunts, and Hannah cries. Now some of you are probably thinking, but Hannah has a husband. He must stick up for her. He must comfort her. Well, he tries. But he seems to have the emotional intelligence of a turtle. Penina taunts, Hannah cries, and Elkanah says this in verse 8. Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Now just stop a moment. She's in tears because she has no children, no status, no secure future. And Elkanah responds by asking if he isn't better than all of that. It's about him, he thinks, not about her. I'm sure he means well, but there are times when husbands need to learn to read the room. This grief is not about him, it's about her. And I can just imagine Hannah giving him a look that says something along the lines of, do you want to try a different question before you get an answer you won't like? He is not better than ten sons. If you've been married or have that close friend or sibling who knows you deeply in the good and the bad of life, they can give you that look that says, you're an idiot, you're my idiot, but you are an idiot. I think that's the look Elkanah got from Hannah. No, he is not better than ten sons. No, he is not helping as his other wife drives Hannah to tears. 
This moment is about Hannah, not him, and he doesn't get it. She is alone in her grief. So what does Hannah do? The sister wife Penine is taunting her. The little stepkids are running around all over the place. Her husband is something less than helpful right now. She's angry and sad, and life is not turning out the, out the way that she had hoped. And there's no hope of getting things, things getting better. So what does she do? She does something that I think all of us will need to do sometimes in life. Not something we should do all of the time. Not something we may even do often, but something that all of us, in moments when life is hard, when it is not going the way you want, when you feel out of control, when you feel alone, when you feel abandoned, when you feel like there is, there is no hope left, she engages in a deeply important spiritual practice. What does she do? First Samuel verse 1 verse 10 tells us, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Hannah weeps bitterly. This is not a prayer of petition asking God for something. She is sharing all of her bitterness and her disappointment with God. God has let her down and she is letting God know it. And I know for many of us, this can feel weird to share our anger or disappointment with God directly to God. It feels disrespectful, not worshipful, irreligious, or even blasphemous. Like we're not honoring God when we complain to God that he's doing a bad job. And yet, it is also incredibly biblical. Fully one-third of the psalms are songs of lament or songs of complaint to God. One entire book, the book of Lamentations, is one book of complaining to God that he's doing a bad job. Following are just a few examples. Psalm 13 begins this way. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Or you think of Psalm 10 that begins this way. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. Eugene Peterson points out in his book, Five Smooth Stones, that the Psalms are organized into five books. Five books of prayer of our response to God set alongside the five books of the Pentateuch, God's words to us. God, as Peterson points out, these books fit together. God speaks and then he teaches us how to speak back. And yet in those five Psalm books, God tells us over and over again that we should complain to God, that we should be upset with God, that we should not understand what God is doing, and it is okay to tell God. One-third of the Psalms are people being upset that God is doing a bad job. Perhaps God is more okay with our complaints and our anger and our frustration with God than we are. So Hannah unloads on God. And then she has an interesting conversation with the priest that ends with the priest blessing her, saying this, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And then, nothing happens. There is no lightning bolt from the sky making her pregnant. She still has the mean sister, wife taunting and picking on her, bringing her to tears. The same emotionally clueless husband... But then, something interesting happens the next morning. We read this in verse 19. Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. The next morning, she gets up, and they come back to the tabernacle, and they worship the Lord. Nothing has changed. Life continues on, and Hannah continues to worship the Lord. She may still despair at times. She may pour out her bitter heart toward God again. But for now, 
she worships. At one point in his ministry, when all the crowds turn away, Jesus asks the disciples if they will leave too. And Peter responds, where else can we go? We can be angry with God. We can be disappointed at times. We can be frustrated and confused. But where else can we go but to the maker of the heavens and the earth? The God who loved us before we ever loved him as we are reminded every time we baptize a baby. And so Hannah gets up and worships God. And now we know, because we read all of the verse, that eventually she has a child. That child is the prophet Samuel. But she doesn't yet know that. She pours out her heart. She weeps bitterly. And the next day she gets up and she worships the Lord. It was almost 20 years ago now that my cousin Dan was diagnosed with leukemia at age 25, right around Labor Day. Other people got better, but he only got sicker. He made it until December 23. My cousin Jason was diagnosed with schizophrenia in his late 20s. He got put on the meds. He moved it home to be with his mom and stepdad so they could keep an eye on him. He struggled with good days and bad. And he lost his battle with schizophrenia nine years ago next month. My cousin Rochelle was diagnosed with cancer six years ago. She was in her mid-40s. Her battle was brutal, and she lost that battle five years ago this coming September, leaving behind three kids, including a preschooler. We prayed for each one to be healed. We prayed over and over again, and many, many tears were shed. We wondered where God was in those moments of grief. And yet each time as a family, we gathered and we worshipped after the lament, after the complaint, because where else can we go but to the one who holds all of our lives in his hands? Our Father who loves us and won't let go of us, even when we are confused and scared and angry. While we may not always understand what God is doing, we trust in his goodness even when we do not see it in the moment. And in our confusion, God was there. In our anger, God stayed by our side. In our grief, God gave us the strength we needed. No matter how life might be going, we get up and we worship because we know our only comfort and hope is that we are not our own, but we belong body and soul and life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has fully paid for all of our sins with his precious blood and has set us free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over us in such a way that not a hair can fall from our head without the will of our Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for our salvation. All things work together for our salvation. We don't get to see the whole picture. We don't get to see all the potential futures and how each action today will affect the coming days, but our God does. Do we understand every decision he makes? Absolutely not. Will God sometimes answer our prayers? For sure. But sometimes he will answer with a no because he knows more than we do. Can we complain in those moments and share, share fears and anxiety and even anger with God? The Psalms tell us we certainly can and that we should, that God will listen. But then the example of Scripture also tells us that we can then pick ourselves up and worship God the next day, knowing that even when we are confused and life doesn't make sense to us, our God is good and we can trust in his goodness more than our understanding. May you believe this good news and go forth to live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed a good God and we can trust you even when your decisions don't always make sense to us. Help us to have the courage to be honest with you in our bitterness and disappointment and frustrations and then also have the strength to come back and worship you again knowing that you are the place that our help is found. You are our source of strength. You are our one true hope. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.